fredags men inte så att den nu var understand this kind of first part here is more like introduction introducing the meth methods okay and then we kind of apply them in the second part so. so you have to be a little bit patient before you really see this and how it works but uh, I will take a, a small example I think on, on how we for instance can use Excel to, to kind of produce this reaction analysis it's really straightforward but uh, first um, I should perhaps put on my microphone so that's a good idea. Okay. There is in the textbook. Uh, I did just need to find my notes here. In the textbook, they look at a special case of this model which is described in, in the late parts of chapter 2. Um, they look at the situation where the x's are time. So in many cases, uh, you can use regression analysis to make trend estimates in a kind of time series fa fashion. Time series data is, of course, data which is serialized on time. So you have one observation in January, one in February, and so on. Uh, we, in our example, which we kind of looked at on, at on the board here, we also in introduced some time-based data. But of course, regression al analysis is not necessarily meant to be used in a time-wise manner. That's not necessary. But in some cases, as I said, uh, it could be that we do so-called regression on time, meaning that the x variable actually is a time variable. Uh, what happens then is, of course, that this x changes values to a more specific part, specific set of values. And that specific set can be applied mathematically to produce a different, in principle, somewhat simpler formula than the one we looked at, actually the two formulas we looked at. If you look in the textbook, I'm not so sure if you find it simpler, but it, let me just show you how it works, OK? So then x1 equals 1, x2 equals 2, and so on, OK? That's the the basic point. What this means then is that we can say something specific about these sums, can't we? The sum i equals 1 to n of xi is then suddenly 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus up to n, isn't it? When we define our axis to be this subset of all possible axes. And if you know some mathematics, which you probably don't, then these sum can be expressed like this. Have you seen this formula before? You have, Maria. Mimonio, you have. What about you, uh, you, Joe? Maybe. And what about our Norwegian friends? Think so. You think so? Okay. Have you seen this one then? Then, of course, we get 1 plus 2 times 2, which is 4, plus 3 times 3, which is 9, and so on, isn't it? It can be written like this. Have you seen this one before, then? Perhaps not. Of course, uh, in the old days, mathematicians load to compute formulas for these series of numbers. So there's a lot of available formulas for different summations of different numbers. These are an example of two of them. Uh, the normal way of doing this is kind of guessing on this formula and then using something which is referred to as an induction proof to actually prove that it's correct. Have you any experience with induction proofs? Perhaps not. But that, that's good because we're going to use it in the first exercise. Then I give you 
an introduction to induction proofs, and an induction proof to perform. Actually, the second one there. So then you get some experience with this. The idea then is, of course, that I would like to test your ability to read a relatively simple mathematical material without knowing it in, in, in front, and see if you're able to actually read and understand what's there and try to perform based on it. That's the idea. But this is basically all there is. So instead of using this x bar now, and this sum of x i, and this sum of x i square, and the sum of the, and so on, we can substitute by these formulas instead. Of course, then the formulas change. Uh, not necessarily in interesting at all, because you can use the original formulas here. Because they, they cover up for any kind of x. So if you just use the original formulas, then it's OK. But if you want to do something analytically, if you want to do something with these maths, you can uh, always use these, these changed formulas in a somewhat different way. But this is really not a big point. You don't really need to care about this. This is not important. The important part was in the previous lecture, where we actually derived the whole simple linear regression model. So now, I would like to make an example, OK? See how we can do this uh, in Excel. Of course, now you, you basically know how you can do it. You can have these two sets of numbers. You can input the numbers into the formula and compute it. Of course, you have to make some sums and some square sums and so on. You have to compute that, input it into the formula and compute. But uh, fortunately, we have some tools which do this for us, more or less out of the box. So let's look how we can do this very simply in Excel. We used Excel somewhat in our event economics course, didn't we? So you remember this tool? Looks like this. I think we used it, didn't we? For some plots and some kind of stuff, OK? So now we need to enter our y's and x's here. So let's uh, construct uh, some observations. Suppose we, we stick to our example of flats in Molde and the interest level. <coughs> So we had some numbers, didn't we? Y, I, X, Y. This is then sold flats. And this is interest level. So let's put in something here. Let's say we can, uh, in a certain year, we sold 100. And then the interest level was low, 3%. Uh, then we sold 50. It was higher, 8%. 75, somewhere in between, maybe not so much, 7%. Uh, uh, a high one that many years ago, 12%. Only 33 <coughs> flats. How many numbers do we need? Maybe a couple of more. There was a 2% observation here. It's actually a little bit smaller than that one, 98, just to make a little it should, in principle, be larger, but it's, I, I just emphasize that these observations should be kind of outside the line now. Uh, a final one, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, six. Should we have something on the 40s here? 49 flats was sold at an interest of 8%. So you see we can have the same value here, but different values here. OK, now we can enter the numbers into Excel and see what's happening or actually how to do it. <coughs> so, uh, should we take the y's first then? Then it's 100, uh, 50, 75, yeah, please help me. 33, 33 98, 98, 49. 49, and then for the x's, 3, 3 8, 8, 7, 12, 12, 12 2, 2 Eight. OK, we have our numbers. The first thing we do is to plot them. Do you remember how to do a plot in Excel, or have you already forgotten? You don't use Excel too much, do you? OK, then we have to do it again. We mark our observations. We insert something. In this case, it should be a graph. Uh, 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 and we should pick a scatter plot. When you want to plot two variables against each other, we always pick a scatter plot. OK, so let's pick a scatter plot here. And uh, maybe we just want the, the, the dots here. So there we see our observations in a plane. 
where the x-axis is oh x-axis is here and then the y-axis is here maybe it should be the opposite way around in any case this is the it seems to be the interest on the y-axis here no and the so which we should have perhaps turned them around maybe we should do that to make it a bit nicer that's easy isn't it just get rid of this one cut it off then we take this one and hit Control X and then Control V and then we do it like this repeat the process pick a scatter plot and now it's right okay now we have the interest on the x-axis and the output in this case the number of sold flat on the y-axis it doesn't really matter it's the same figure isn't it so you see here now we have these options so drawing over line we can uh, draw it uh, perhaps somewhere in between here if we would guess, don't you think so? You have to try to guess where it should be. It seems to maybe it should go through this point and then in between here and up here. Okay? That's our guess. Let's see what the model does. Now this is very easy. You just click on the points to mark them. Then you right click. And then it says add trend line down here. Okay? Just click the add trend line and then you can make some choices here. You can choose different types of regression models here. You see you can use nonlinear, exponential, logarithmic, polynomial, power, moving average, or you can pick what is preset here, the linear model, which is the one we have looked at. So let's pick that one. You can also put constraints here. You can see you can set the intercept. So if you want your equation to go through certain points, you can force the model to do that, forcing the line, for instance, to go through the origo. In some cases, that can be logical, okay? So if there is no activity, there should be no output, okay? In that case, you would like the line to go through the origo. So there's uh, a lot of options here. Let's see, we want to display the equation on the chart. Yes, we would like to do that. Then, of course, we get the values for the A and B. And then I would suggest that we also display R squared value on the chart. I haven't told you what that is, but uh, we will do that. Okay, and then we just uh, hit close here. And then we get the line. You see, our guess was not perfectly correct. It does not go through this point. It's slightly below here, but it goes almost in between here. So it wasn't so bad. Okay, we kind of wanted to put that point a little bit on top. At least I did. I don't know what you did, but... Uh, but there you see how easy it can be done. Okay, you see the actual equation here. Minus 7.2921x plus 116.11, which then is the final version of our straight line. And you also see an R square here, which equals to 0 0.9224. Can you guess what that is? Now let me make a little change in the numbers here. Suppose I put 1,000 here. What happened then? Of course, our observations changed from kind of looking at lying on a straight line to being very different. What happened to R square? It went from 0 0.97 down to 0 0.3. So this R square measures, in a sense, how good our line fits the observations. So if we have a high R square, then our observations are kind of centered around the line. Okay? If it's 1, then it's a perfect fit. The closer to 0, the more the observations are kind of outside the line. So this R square is a very convenient way of measuring whether our model seems to fit reality in a good manner or a bad manner. So the only difference here, from what you at least should be used to making plots, is to pick the right correct plot, which should be a scatter plot, and then mark the observations by clicking on one of them, then right click to pick up the menu where you can choose add a trend line. Of course, this mechanism only fixes linear simple regression with a single variable. If you want to do more than that, that is also available in Excel. But uh, I don't think we need to look for that yet.
and we move to the second part of the course, we will do a multiple regression, and then uh, I think we need to look into those parts of Excel. Then you need to kind of use these tools in Excel to, to make it work. As you see, it's very easy, straightforward. And it, this is something you really need to know, okay? It's uh, how to do a very quick, simple linear regression. It's always a nice thing to do. You, there's numerous occasions you find it convenient to do this analysis. So uh, as long as Excel makes it so easy, it's nice to know how. So let's go back to our original model, which had 100 here. Then, of course, it goes back to the original form with this R square, which is close to 1, which kind of means this seems like a fairly good model in a sense. Okay. Even though we see that there is some distances between the points and the line. Of course, if I like, I can change these points closer to a straight line, can't I? Uh, yeah, that, that is a tedious work. I don't uh, think we should do that. Okay, any questions on this matter? What kind of information does it give you? What kind of information does it give me? Mm -hmm. It gives me, the line is the information I get out of this. This straight line, actually these numbers, these values for A and B. So you maybe you ask, what can I use this for? Mm -hmm. Okay. I can take an example. Uh, in practice, you, you probably know that uh, smoking is dangerous to your lungs. That's why you have started uh, or stopped. Maybe you never started, I don't know. At least that was my case. I used to smoke, now I've stopped. Uh, so you would expect that the more you smoke, the more occurrences of lung cancer should be available in the macro sense. So if you measure them, you pick a person, a kind of random person, uh, ask him, do you smoke? He says, yes, okay, how much do you smoke? You note that and then you follow that person and see if he catches lung cancer, okay? You do the same with another person, he says, no, okay, you follow him as well. So you keep on doing this and then you, finally you get the data set, okay? And this axis would that be the number of cigarettes smoked in a certain period and then you on the left hand side it would be either it's lung cancer or not, okay? So you would expect then that the more you smoke the more lung cancer would be there. And then you can do a regression. And you can do so a little bit more on these matters. You can for instance do a test on whether this parameter which is kind of linked to the connection here, this B parameter is either zero or not. And that test kind of then confirms whether there is a link between smoking and lung cancer. So this is a classical example of application of regression analysis in, in a matter which has meant something for some people. So, uh, of course, the ideal way would be to do a kind of microbiological analysis, kind of showing what actually is happening in person's lungs when you smoke cigarettes, and of course they have done that as well. But this is kind of used as confirming hypotheses about stuff. Okay. In principle, the method is, is, uh, was made <coughs> Uh, in situations where you could perform controlled experiments. If you know some physics, you probably know that uh, if I uh, look at the vacuum tube, okay, this is a tube where no, it doesn't have any air in it, okay, and then I have a device here where I have a ball, and I can drop this ball here. So then I can change the distance from where I drop the ball then I can measure the distance and the time spent before the ball hits the ground. Okay? So I can measure S, which is distance, and T, which is time. Okay? If you know some physics, you probably know that there's uh, something called Newton's second law. Have you heard about that? Yeah, it uh, looks like this. Force equals mass times acceleration. And by doing some slight math on this one, you can arrive at the conclusion which says that the distance which should be traveled by an object without air resistance and their only influence of the gravity looks like this. Okay? This is a classical, very simple formula from physics. The point here is this is an experiment we can control. Okay? I can kind of change here, then I put it down here, I repeat the experiment. And I can move on like this till I get the amount of observations that I would like to have. 
Now, of course, I can measure the S, that is a number. I can measure the T, that is also a number. And I can square it, which, of course, is also a number. So these could play the part of Y, and these could play the part of X. Of course, I can put this half in here, so then I get this equation here. Y equals G times X, if you like. And if I force this through Oreo, I can do a regression here to estimate this G. This G is something like 9.87 or something around C surface, and it changes whether you're up or down. It's kind of a physical constant, which tells, tells uh, how much uh, acceleration a person or any object gets if you throw them out of an airplane. What you should use that for is something different, but uh, then you can do a controlled regression. Uh, and in this case, you, kind of, you have a model, it's sensible, and you can test it by doing regression. So that was kind of the original application of this stuff. Later on, of course, people observe that if I have data, I can still do regressions, even though I can't con control the experiment. If you think about the smokers, you would really have to tell somebody you should smoke and you should not smoke. That would be kind of an unethical experiment, don't you think? Yeah, like uh, Mengele did uh, during the Second World War and that kind of stuff. It's, it's not assumed custom to design experiments like that, okay? So you can't, so you kind of, you kind of get the data you get, and that, that is a weakness with doing regression. It could always provide errors. The other problem with regression is that it could be underlying variables. If you think about smoking, the only thing you actually show is that people who actually smoke get more lung, lung cancer than people who don't. But it could be reasons why certain people smoke and certain people do not smoke. You see? We, we know that. Certain people smoke, certain people try to smoke but do not continue to smoke. Other people try to smoke and continue to smoke. It could be a difference between these two groups, couldn't it? They could have different genes, for instance. Those genes could be actually be such that in principle, that the people who smoke, if they didn't smoke, they would actually catch more lung cancer than they did smoke. Do you see my point? You can't guarantee this. And this is the problem with applying these kind of methods in research in general. However, many people do all the time. So you must be very careful. A true causal, causal relationship is not necessarily easy to, to find. So even something which seems quite obvious, the link between lung cancer and cigarette smoking, is really not in principle obvious, even though it seems kind of. Everybody who has smoked uh, has gotten the feeling that this is not healthy. You, you get more colds, you get more pain in, and so on, so it's, it's, it, it's something there, I think. So this is what you can do it for research or in practice if you want to. It could be a production process, for instance, where you have a variable you can man manipulate and you want to find out how the production re uh, process responds to your manipulations. Then you can do experiments and you can, for instance, find out that if I put uh, turn this, turn a little bit more, I get a little bit more out. So you can try to optimize your production environment. This is another application. So there are numerous possible applications for this. And of course in forecasting, as we shall see later on. We can do it, use this in forecasting, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? Suppose we, we observe <coughs> the height of Norwegian young men on their military initial service. <coughs> okay, we do that in Norway. So each time a recruit comes to start doing military service, there is a measurement of height and weight. Okay, let's stick to height. Okay. Now suppose we have a lot of, inf uh, of time information about this height, and we know something if you look at these data. They are kind of in increasing. You've seen that, haven't you? People get higher yeah. everywhere in the world. Okay. So you, if you observe that, and you have time here, and then you have. I think then you get, uh, you get an impression that there might, this might be a, some kind of connection which, which may continue. And if you want to use this for prediction, then of course you can say, okay, today people are 186, okay, this is 2013. Let's go back to the Viking age, see how tall they were there, okay. This is around 1,000 years ago, maybe they were just 140 then, I don't know. 
And we can use that. Of course, <coughs> we can use this the other way. Just extrapolate here. And say if we move 100 years ahead, no, maybe there are 210 then. Okay. Of course, at some point, we get the feeling that this gets silly, don't we? Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe not. It's a, it's a matter of uh, how we feel. But th that is the typical way of using regression in forecasting. We will return to this later on. Okay, any other questions? Do we need to save this? Do you want to have this? Yes, okay. Yes. Save. Uh, desktop. What should we call it? Regression example. Flats in Molden. Oh. Yeah, this seems almost correct. Save. Okay, let me put it up on the front there immediately. Is it here? Is it here? No, this was just. So what happened to the fronter button? Do you know? This is in Norwegian. Maybe it's easier to find it in English. Student life? No. Study programs? No. Research? No. Students. Students? Where is students? Oh, up. Oh. There. Ah, there it was. Great job. You helped me a lot. Java stuff. Do not show this again for this app. Maybe that will help. Event logistics, documents, and I put it in an added material here then. Okay, let's just uh, upload it. This is in Norwegian. I'm sorry about that, but it, uh, this was just. Uh, what happened to the over file? There it is. Open, save. Okay, now it's on the bottom here. So we have saved that one. And let's move out of this. No, that was not possible. Okay. So this was the first half, the causal models. Of course, uh, there could be a lot to say, more to say about this than what I have said now. As you probably understand, there are uh, many possible courses in the regression analysis alone. So uh, we just skim the top here, so to speak. Okay, let me take out and move on. So the next topic would then be time series models. In a time series model, we regress variables on them on, on, on themselves actually. So in a time series model, we we have a structure as follows. We have our result variable as a function of the same variable in earlier time periods. as many as we like and then we must of course here as well include error terms okay so we must have some kind of error term here in the same manner as we had in the regression model to kind of fit the actual model but we can open up for a more general structure here where we have 
more than one error term also regressed on themselves. So in general, this would be a typical time series model. And the idea here is very simple. We have some observations in the past. These observations have a certain pattern. Can we find some sort of mathematical model which could kind of recreate the past pattern, which we can use to predict future patterns? So if our history looks something like this, we are here now. Does it seem reasonable then to try to make a prediction which continues this pattern? Okay? That is the basic idea. Very simple. Just like in the regression case with the height, it could be very silly. On the other hand, on the relatively short term, as we deal with in logistics, perhaps not so silly. Of course, if history changes at this point, maybe it could be like this instead, going down. In that case, we miss very much by doing this. But to be able to distinguish this pattern <coughs> or this path from this path would mean the need of additional information. Say, no, we are at the top, it goes down. So this is basically what time series analysis is about, trying to recreate historical pattern, extrapolating these patterns into the future and use them for decision support in logistics. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are certain standard patterns. We have the trend pattern, which is a line either up or down, saying that something is increasing or something is going down. You see this in practice, don't you? If you sell a product, either it, it's growing or it's uh, decreasing. So trend is a kind of pattern which is possible to recognize. The second one, which also is important, season. Things go up, things go down, things go up again. Seasonal patterns are typical in many practical situations, perhaps not so much in events as in other situations. Many products uh, have obvious seasonalities, ice cream for instance, sold little in winter in Norway much more in summer. The same with beer. In Africa, it's, you don't have these strong seasonal patterns, perhaps, due to the different climate. Umbrellas are, of course, sold more in the autumn and in winter, especially in Bergen, than in summer. So there's a lot of weather-related seasonal patterns, which are kind of obvious. Do you have any other seasonal patterns, do you think? We have something we can refer to as calendar seasons. There are certain products which are sold more in certain time periods, which is not weather related. For instance, at Christmas. Then we sell special stuff, don't we? Special Christmas food, Christmas trees, and that kind of stuff. There is not much sale of Christmas trees outside the last week of December. So that is a very short season, but a very strong season. Easter products, you know, yellow rabbits, whatever. In Molde, for instance, I would expect that the beer consumption has a, a double week seasonal pattern. So each time there is a home match here, you sell more beer in general in Molde than the week after when there is an away match. Perhaps. I don't know. I would expect that. Of course, you see the same pattern related to these matches when it comes to, to bed nights at the hotels. There are more if, if there are big matches against big opponents locally, then Rosenborg or Wodranga, so there will be some more guest nights on the hotel. So you see these seasonal effects. Any other seasonal effects you can think of? 
is this calendar, this weather? There are probably a lot more, but uh, that's really not the point. The point is that we observe these effects and we, we must kind of try to, to take them into account when we make our forecasts. We see it in the housing market, don't we? we there's a drop down before summer, keeps low at summertime and then takes up again when summer stops. So summer is holiday, nothing is going on, and so on. They don't hire many journalists in summertime, do they? There's not much to write about, so you don't need any journalists, and you just uh, use the same story as last summer. We have this time. In Norwegian we call it agurktid, uh, which means in English would be translated to cucumber time. Have you, uh, is that, I don't know whether that's an English term actually, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> it means that uh, you can write about cucumbers, I assume. Uh, whether that's actually is the case. So, so there's a lot of seasonality around, and uh, that must be taken into account. Okay, uh, then we have something we call uh, cycles. In principle, cycles uh, behave like seasons, but they're kind of longer waves. They could kind of return in 10 years or 30 years or 50 years or whatever, okay? It's uh, a lot of economic stuff seems to follow such cycles. There's a lot of disagreement about whether they actually exist. Uh, we seem to see in capitalistic economies that uh, it may run with growth a certain period, then there's a recession. And these waves are kind of long, okay? Now we're in a situation where there is a recession and it's maybe... There's a fair long time before we had, uh, had such a big one as we have now, at least in Europe, perhaps not in Norway, but in Europe it's been very bad in, in a certain time period now, uh, but uh, there's a fair amount of time since the last depression period. So these cycles could be interesting. On the other hand, from a log logistics point of view, we probably normally don't look into these long time periods, so cycles is perhaps not what we're looking so hard to find. Uh, as we see it now with the depression, it would more be perhaps more like a decreasing trend, which is kind of what we look at. So we expect some, some negative growth in, in, in the years to come if, if we do business in, in various areas. Okay. Of course, randomness itself, noise, as we say, in, uh, is a pattern which kind of doesn't have a pattern. Okay, so th that is a part of prediction. We have to kind of identify which, what what is really patterns and what is not a pattern, which we cannot, which we cannot uh, predict. And as I said. Um, certain weather phenomena. Uh, it's not necessarily that easy to predict if we move a few weeks ahead. So, so there, are, there are parts of certain economic phenomena uh, should uh, as uh, with certainty be, be have, uh, have real randomness uh, related to them to, to avoid uh, these money pump arguments. Okay, let's uh, define a new notation now. Now we stick to the textbook notation, okay? So let's uh, use that. So instead of using y now for the predictive variable, we, we use um, 2 5 notation. We say that um, d1, d2, capital D, up to dn is observed demand values. So from now on when we talk about uh, demand we use this capital D to denote it. So the structure is that we know D1, D2, up to a certain point DT. This is now, okay? So this is what we know. We observe these values and we want to say something about what's happening after here. We want to predict dt plus 1, maybe dt plus 2, and so on for a certain amount of periods in the future. Uh, 
these predictions are given names. So FT is the forecast for DT on time T. Okay, this is, you see this? Yeah, I observe something. And uh, maybe I've made a forecast a, a few pairs in front, so I have these forecast, but I also have the observation at a certain point in previous time. And you stand uh, at the, the no time, of course, you don't have the observation. This dt is not present, but we can, of course, have an, an ft here, which is the prediction for this time. That's the whole point here, is to produce this one to say something about this, which you do not know. But as time rolls on, you will get this information. So then you can construct uh, 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 then you can construct a so-called prediction error or a forecast error. So uh, forecast error is then simply the difference between the forecast and the actual observed the mon value. We, in this uh, notation, they use et for it, not epsilon t, as we used in the in the regression case. Uh, we started by oh, it's time for a break, isn't it? Yeah, I think we take a break. Okay. I got the remote, didn't I? Let's see if it works. <coughs> <coughs> 